Welcome to Life-Giving Water Messages, where I expound upon the Word of God and, through the internet, deliver it to you. Today, and my name is Reverend Todd Laddick, and today I'm bringing you part uh, four of a four-part series entitled Esther, based off of Esther, chapter 3, verse 13, and chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. So, let us dive into the Word today. Dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Amen. For such a time as this, we are positioned to be agents for God. My wife, Bernadette, is literally a hero, and I mean literally. Uh, she is a healthcare hero, a nurse who has a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Uh, but when I say she is a hero, I'm not just speaking about degrees or titles. She has literally saved people's lives before. And when she was working in the hospital years ago, she worked on a medi-surgical floor or medical surgical floor, which if you're a nurse, you know that is a chaotic floor to work on. It's not a cush job. Not that there really are any cush nursing jobs in a hospital, but outside of the emergency room, that floor is up there in difficulty and workload. One day after a shift was ending, her and a colleague and friend were walking out of work together uh, past the labor and delivery uh, wing when suddenly they heard a code go out from that wing stating that someone was having a heart attack. They were coding. And Bernadette and her friend, being right there, ran in and were the first responders to do CPR, which saved the person's life, literally. They were in the right place at the right time. And they were the right people. And I'd imagine most healthcare workers would have done the same thing. But, you know, there are people out there who would have just ignored that. You know, I'm, I'm on my way out. Let somebody else handle it. Uh, Bernadette and her friend didn't do that. And I'd, like I said, I'd imagine a lot of others wouldn't as well. Because that's it takes those kind of people to be in healthcare. It takes those people who put others before themselves in order to uh, serve people day in and day out. And we all know when we're in a hospital or a doctor's office who those nurses are. We also know the nurses who really ought to not be a nurse. And we've all dealt with both of those. But again, um, one day, you know, she was walking past that. A code went out and her and her friend were right there. And they were able to save that person's life literally through CPR. And the person wasn't a patient, actually, but was a, a family member of someone who was a new mommy and daddy. And Bernadette and her friend saved that woman's life and gave that baby a grandma or aunt or whoever to know and love. To say I'm proud of her would be an understatement. And I'm <laughs> let me say I'm proud of anyone who serves others in life or soul-saving ways. Speaking of which, let me share some key highlights of the Methodist movement. First, John Wesley valued women as leaders in the church. 
And he was no doubt influenced by his mother, Susanna Wesley, who, in the wake of her husband being in debtor's prison and her dissatisfaction with the preaching of his substitute, began preaching to people in the afternoons and that became actually well attended. And due to Wesley's respect for women leaders because of his mother, who was a strong woman leader, Methodists came to be a big part of the woman's suffrage movement. But it doesn't stop there. The earliest Methodists, starting with John and Charles Wesley, visited people in prison. Uh, they met The early Methodists wrote and, and came up with a social creed that spoke against child labor laws. They established schools and educational opportunities for the common people and were at the forefront of the push for public education. They worshipped weekly in church and gathered in small groups, encouraging and supporting each other in the faith. The earliest Methodists stood up for racial justice and fought for the end of slavery. And I could go on and on and on. If this is the voice of the original people called Methodists, who is God calling us to be? And what is God calling us to do today? First, God, and, and before before I I uh, go there, let me let me say this. Let me add a little background to the story of of Esther. Esther was a actually a, a Jewish girl named Hadassah, uh, and she um, was born in Babylon. Now to explain this. Uh, you have to understand that, um, or not, I should say, yeah, she was born in Babylon, um, but under the Persian ruler. Now, you have to remember that back in in the Bible, uh, we, we know that um, uh, during Jeremiah's time, the Jews got came under attack from Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed everything, and they took a whole slew of Jewish leaders and priests and other people, and he exiled them to Babylon to show that he was the true ruler and then he put up a puppet king who had to pay tribute to him and all of that to keep him from doing the same thing again. Meanwhile, all of these other leaders and, and by the hundreds were, were taken and brought to exile to live in Babylon. After a time, uh, the Persians came and took over, <laughs> conquered Babylon uh, and Cyrus uh, freed those Jews and allowed them to return home, but not all of them went. Some of them decided to stay there. They had families there. That's the only home they had known after a couple of generations of living in, uh, in Babylon. So to go back to Jerusalem or Israel, uh, where they might not even be wanted back, it was, it, it, they'd have to make a treacherous journey. It made no sense. So they stayed there and uh, lived fine among the uh the persians there uh the persians were were kind to the jews until they weren't <laughs> right just like the egyptians and uh there came a point where uh this you know we get into the story of esther where um uh you know this king is looking for uh, a bride his wife has embarrassed him so he divorces her and so he wants somebody to be a bride. And of course, uh, it's proposed that he go searching through the kingdom for them. So he, uh, he goes looking for Persian girls to be his bride. And, and he comes to the house of Esther and Mordecai. And of course, Esther's not her name. Again, it's Hadassah. And uh, Hadassah, Hadassah, uh, you know, gets picked to go and live in the harem and be trained to be uh, a concubine to the king. And from these women, he's going to pick his bride, you know, so there's a real competition here. You can imagine a reality show today being being uh, made in Babylon, or in, uh, yeah, Babylon uh, by the Persian king over this. 
but um, but all the same. Uh, so she changes her name to Esther so that everybody thinks she is a Persian rather than a Jew uh, because Jews aren't very uh, well accepted and she would have no chance or, cho you know, she would have no uh, chance of pleasing the king and that wouldn't be good for her or her family. So basically she takes on the name Esther and acts as if she's a Persian and eventually the king falls in love with her, okay? Um, and so she is the king's, up to this point, concubine or sex slave, if you will. And the king can have as many of these as he wants, married or not. And uh, so he has sexual relations with uh, Esther and falls in love with her. And lo and behold, she becomes queen. He chooses her to be queen. Okay. Now, while this is happening, he, uh, uh uh, Mordecai is also serving in the court on behalf of her, you know, she's family, so he's serving on the court now uh, as the, you know, as, as a, an advisor to the king, so to speak. But the top advisor is this guy Haman, and Haman doesn't like Mordecai. Why? Because Haman wants Mordecai to bow to him, but Mordecai will not bow to him because he is a Jew. See, and that's the thing. They don't know... Uh, as I say this, they don't know that Esther and him are uh, are family, but Esther, ha you know, like he obviously ends up working for the king and is close to Esther, um, and and the king likes him, likes him a lot. He he's done very well for the king, but Haman does not like him again because this guy would not kneel before Haman because uh, he would only kneel before God. And so Haman was angry, not happy about that at all, and uh, decides to get back at Mordecai. But how is he going to get back at Mordecai? Not by going after Mordecai alone. Heck no. He's going to go after all Jewish people. Why not, right? That sounds like the great thing to do. That sounds just like what an evil person would do, right? And Haman proves himself to be evil. And he goes to the king and says, oh, these Jews, they're getting everything that they want, and they've never shown loyalty to you, and they could uprise and take you. And the, he gets the king's ear on a drunken night, and the king's like, yes, I agree. And, and Haman gets the king to agree and sign on to setting up this one day where every good Babylonian could go out and just purge their, their or every good Persian, I should say, could go out and purge um, their, their land of Jews. And word of this gets to Mordecai, and Mordecai sends word to Esther. And Mordecai is telling Esther, we need your help. And Esther's like, what do you want me to do? At this, by this point, the king had kind of distanced himself from her, and she wasn't even sure if he loved her, right? And so you're asking me to beg the king when the king may not even like me, and I'm not even allowed to go to the king unless the king invites me. So how can I even do this? If I do that, the king could put me to death by law. I should be put to death. And this is when Mordecai says, don't think for a second that you hiding away in some palace, you're going to get away with this while your people are slaughtered. Trust me, we'll all go down in the end for this. And who knows, maybe you were put as queen for just such a time as this. And that's where we are today, reading our scripture. So let me say that first, God is using the right person or people to bring about God's justice. Even if the world uh, or they may not see it that way. And truthfully, we need the faith to see it that way, lest we fall into seeing it as the world does. We have to trust that God's got things covered. We have to trust that. We have to trust that God's got things covered and um, we have to put our faith in God. But like Esther, we also have to know that God is including us in the plan and trust God enough to say yes. But let's, let's see how God worked through Esther in this situation. Esther hid her Jewish identity and became the queen to the Persian king. Without knowing that minor detail, 
the king's advisor, Haman, made an edict to kill the entire Jewish population. In order to do this, of course, the king's approval was needed. And he got that without being honest about his real intentions, which was, of course, revenge against Mordecai. And again, the king really liked Mordecai. So so Haman isn't really coming out and saying, oh, I want to get revenge against Mordecai because he slighted me in public. He's saying, oh, the Jews aren't loyal to you. We need to get rid of them. But his real intentions, again, are to get revenge against Mordecai. So he's deceptive to the king. It would have been very easy, I am sure most tempting, for Esther to turn her back and say nothing. I mean, what was she, a woman, to do? If she came to the king uninvited, per law, she could be killed. And to make matters worse, her and the king had again grown a bit more distance than, distant than they once were, making her being killed for the rebel act seemingly more likely. I mean, for real, what could she do? Well, Mordecai, again, Esther's uh, cousin, challenged her to speak to the king on behalf of the Jewish people. And I always, I always call Mordecai her uncle, but I actually think he was her, her cousin. But he, he's kind of like an uncle figure to her in a lot of ways. You know, like kind of giving her that, that, that advice. And God, God is calling Esther here through Mordecai to use her privilege and position courageously. Again, for her to approach the king unrequested, the punishment was death. I'll say it again. To approach the king unrequested, the punishment was death. Death. Thankfully, God's message, message is dealt to her through Mordecai, through her cousin. And Esther ends up pleading for her people's lives all the while exposing Haman's treachery. And so the king grants her request and has Haman executed in the manner that he was planning on executing Mordecai. Which brings me to the next point that must be made here. Nothing, nothing stops God, certainly not a human edict. The edict was understood to be an all-encompassing final law. It was given with absolute human authority. And yet God cleared a different path through Esther for God's people. Finally, with Esther, we see again that God's people will not be destroyed. Like the Israelites under Deborah's care, the spies under Rahab's care, and the church under Lydia's care. God will continue to work for the salvation of God's people. God takes hopeless situations and brings hope into and out of them. So let me ask you this. Are there groups of God's people or areas of justice for whom or for which you are passionate about advocating? could be any area, including but not limited to women's rights, education, our environment, racial justice, food insufficiency, poverty, homelessness, youth, senior citizens, mental health, etc. How is God calling you to create courageously speak up for change in such a time as this? In the week ahead... What is one way you could use your position or your voice and skill set to bring about justice? Friends, justice matters to God. 
So often, God is called just by those advocating for and perpetuating ungodly policies and practices. But God sees us and God knows our hearts. Justice matters to God because all people are created in the divine image of God. And God continually calls God's people to care for creation and for one another, especially vulnerable and exploited groups of people. Collectively, we are called to be doers of justice. Remember that Micah tells us this in uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Let us together, like Esther, rise up for such a time as this, putting Christ at the forefront of everything we do, loving and serving others as Christ first loved and served us. Let us be people who seek justice, who love mercy, and walk humbly. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we just thank you and praise you for all that you are doing in our lives. We thank you for your presence, for loving us, and for guiding us. Help us, Lord, to trust you and to put our whole trust in you so that we may grow into the people you've created us to be. Guide us and lead us. We are yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, thank you for tuning in. As always, I want to uh, uh, just, you know, wish the best to you, and I, I hope that you are getting stuff uh uh, out of this uh, as I get you know out of uh, putting into it and uh, truthfully uh, I learn hopefully you know you're learning but I learn uh, as well and um, it, it's just you know a blessing to be able to do this ministry uh, as always uh, check out the episode notes uh, in there are links to uh, our giving pages if you're able to give uh, to the church I serve uh, that would be great uh, if uh, you are not able, that is fine. This is uh, here for you regardless, and I hope it blesses you. But remember, you are richly blessed so that you may be a blessing to others. Go in peace.